I'm Erica Zavaleta. This is Ecosystems of California. And today we're in the rocky intertidal ecosystem here on the North California coast. We're on the coast north of Santa Cruz today in an intertidal area that's bounded by the ocean on the west and north and then behind by these rocky cliffs and bluffs. So the intertidal here is interspersed with pocket beaches for a long way up the coast. And the intertidal in general is just defined by constant change. The term intertidal means between the tides. So for roughly half of every day, this is submerged. It's under the ocean and for roughly half of every day, it's exposed to the sun, to drying, and to terrestrial rather than marine predators. California's coast experiences two tidal cycles every day. That means that every six hours, these systems are going all the way from wet to dry, and then the next six hours from dry back to wet. So there are two high tides and two low tides each day. There's a higher high and a lower high tide, and then there's a higher low tide and a lower low tide. Places like where I'm standing, the very highest zones in the inner tidal will get covered by water only once a day at the higher high tide. And then at the very bottom, there are places that will emerge from the water only once a day at the lower low tide. It's about nine o'clock in the morning right now and we're at the lower low tide for today. The tidal day is not actually 24 hours long. It's closer to 25 hours long. That means that the timing of the tides shifts forward by about 50 minutes every day, so that low and high tides are happening at different times throughout the month. One of the things that means is that for work and research in the intertidal, we have to be paying attention to when we can get daytime low, low tides so that we can see a lot of these communities that otherwise are submerged. Especially if you're sessile, you have to deal with this incredible range of fluctuating conditions here in the intertidal. You have to deal with immersion under the water, with immersion at times like this at low tide. You have to deal with a big range of temperatures when you're exposed to the air, desiccation, and then salinity. When it rains at low tide, these tide pools will fill essentially with fresh water. So these organisms have to deal with that whole range of physical stresses. And then in addition to that, they have to be able to deal with everything from fresh water to ocean water. So how do you do that? Anemones deal with immersion during the low tides by closing up. So this anemone's got all its tentacles on the inside. And you can see here that it's collected little bits of shell and placed them all around its body as a, a kind of armor or protection. And you can see it even more on some of these individuals that are smaller and maybe even more emerged at the low tide. And this one's just in the process of closing up because the sun's hit it. So They'll close up when they're not immersed in water, but they'll also close up to avoid high temperatures in the middle of the day, even if they are underwater. So in these horizontal tide pools, there's this incredible diversity of strategies. If you look at the plants, we have surf grasses, we have all kinds of algae, including these leafy forms. We have these thin films and crusts that are great for dealing with wave action. There are epiphytes, there are erect, coralline algae, and we have greens, browns, and reds growing all over the rocky surfaces and even on some of the sessile animals. And then the animal strategies are really diverse too. So some of these animals like limpets are really low profile titans and limpets. They can resist wave action and resist being sheared off of the boulders, but they're less competitive than things like these mussels, but they grow fast. They can cover a lot of area. They are the dominant in the middle lower intertidal in a lot of California. So wave action and sea stars help make room for other things by removing these mussels from time to time. And then we have all the mobile animals, the turban snails, which are grazers and are feeding on this algae, the crabs, Ow! <laughs> the fishes and really important predators like sea stars and octopi. Out on those most exposed rocky headlands are sea palms, those erect plants that, in spite of the fact that they're standing up like that, have an incredible ability to withstand the forces of wave action. And they're protected from sport harvest and from development in California, but not from commercial harvest. So what do things eat in the intertidal? A lot of the sessile organisms eat when the water covers them. They're eating zooplankton and phytoplankton and other waterborne particles and detritus 
using tentacles, like if you're an anemone, or sieve-like legs if you're a barnacle, or some other part of a range of sticky and filter-like appendages that the organisms can extend into the water at higher tides. Then we have a lot of grazers, and they're eating the plants. They generally can move a little, or in some cases a lot. A big grazer is sea urchins, which we don't have here, thanks to the recovery of sea otters. So you just occasionally find the exoskeletons of a sea urchin, but rarely step on one. Another big grazer in the intertidal in California used to be abalones, but because of harvest, we don't find them very much, except in deeper waters these days. And then there are turban snails, owl limpets, and other grazers that are feeding on the algae in the intertidal. Then we have the carnivores. Mobile predators range widely. They include seabirds like gulls and shorebirds like black oyster catchers that move in to eat at lower tides. Then we have things like fishes and lobsters that will come in to eat at high tides. At night, foxes, raccoons, and invasive or feral terrestrial animals like cats and rats can come down to feed in the intertidal too. Other predators live in the intertidal all the time, like octopi, predatory snails, and sea stars. Wow, this is cool. So here's a sea star, and if I keep my hand away from it, you can actually see that it's moving, it's eating, its feet are out. And we didn't see a lot of sea stars for a long time because in 2013, this massive wave of an epidemic called sea star wasting disease swept through the California coast. It went as far north as Alaska, and it affected all species of sea stars. So in 2013 into 2014, we just lost all of the sea stars on the coast. It's very rare to see them. So it's great to see them back. And so sea stars are these really important mobile predators in the intertidal. A lot of the animals here aren't moving. These guys are cruising around, ripping mussels. You can see a little hermit crab right here is actually cruising along the top of that sea star, maybe eating something. Those hermit crabs, which you can see some bigger ones of out here, they're pretty omnivorous. They'll eat meat. They'll eat dead carrion, they'll eat detritus. So they're pretty good cleaners in these tide pools at low tide like this. At low tide, you can see some of the tide pool resident fishes, like these tide pool gobies, really well camouflaged with the sand. Some organisms in the intertidal experience what we call really strong, direct, benthic pelagic coupling. And what that means is that the benthos the organisms attached to the bottom are strongly coupled to the open ocean. So organisms like these mussels have a planktonic larval phase. Their larvae will be out in the ocean for three or four months, in some cases, as part of the plankton, and then they'll settle onto rocks and establish as adults. So they're strongly coupled to the ocean for dispersal and gene flow. When they get to the sessile stage as adults, they remain strongly coupled to the ocean because they're relying on the high tide influx of water for nutrients and detritus to feed on. And so at both stages of their life cycle, whether they're in the ocean looking for settling sites or on the rocks looking for food, they're directly tied to both the land and the water column. Along most shores, the intertidal zone is clearly separated into high, middle, and low intertidal subzones. Each one has a characteristic set of species in it, and you can see those clear patterns of zonations on the rocks over there. So at the top, you have, along the California coast, barnacles, typically. Then in the upper middle zone, you would have rockweeds, some of the algae like sylvetia and fucus, and mussels a little bit below that. And then finally, you can see when you get down lower, you just get this huge variety of macrophytes, and the red algae, the kelps, and the surf grasses in the low zone. California is one of the world's most important upwelling regions. Although upwelling regions are only about 1% of the ocean surfaces in the world, they're the source of about half of the seafood that people harvest every year. And what an upwelling region is, is that upwelled waters, which are clear and cold and loaded with nutrients, are brought up from depth. They happen here along the California coast because of prevailing winds that are blowing along shore towards the equator, so south here. The winds combine with broad ocean circulation patterns that are clockwise in the northern Pacific. And that drives surface waters away from shore. So as the surface waters move away, these deeper cold waters come up 
bringing tons of nutrients with them. That makes the inner tidal here incredibly productive. And those upwelling patterns shape actually a lot of the terrestrial and coastal environments in California too in ways that we'll explore later on during the course. We're back at the same spot north of Santa Cruz that we visited at low tide in the morning. This evening we've got a six foot high tide and most of the tide pools we were walking around in are submerged, but you can kind of see the edge of it right here. This is the time when filter feeders have got their appendages out, barnacles and mussels and so on will be actively feeding. This is also the time when mobile animals like fishes and lobsters will be in the intertidal feeding as well. And because this is still the high, high tide for the day, everything's getting submerged, even the stuff that didn't get submerged at the lower high tide. This is also the period when larvae of these sessile animals with a pelagic larval phase can be settling out onto the rocks. But as you can see, wave action is posing a constant challenge to animals that are attached to the rocks.